Now, here's a problem that gives diplomats all over the world a headache. Is it possible for outsiders to do nation building and create robust democracies? The experience of Iraq and Afghanistan throws up obvious difficulties, but for a while, East Timor was supposed to be a model of success. Since 1999, the United Nations, helped for a time by British troops, began to create what looked like a thriving democracy in a land laid waste by Indonesian occupation. The UN declared victory in 2002, but now, suddenly, everything is in jeopardy. Amid fears, the country has started to fall apart. Jonathan Head has reported from East Timor for 10 years and now assesses when nation-building becomes nation-falling apart. In a matter of weeks, the world's youngest country has fallen apart. What began as a dispute over army promotions has turned into a war between neighbours. Thousands of buildings have been torched. Around one in eight East Timorese have been driven from their homes. The police and army have broken up into rival camps. An Australian-led military force has had to fly in to hold this country together. It's a disaster for East Timor, but it's a disaster for the international community as well, because this was supposed to be their poster child. The proof that UN-guided nation-building could work. So this was one of your main timblers. I've come to see my old friend Edu who's built one of the few successful indigenous businesses in East Timor, a furniture workshop. Uh, here in this place I have uh, uh, around 17 point uh, cubic meters of uh, thick wood, and now nothing left. Uh, it was very sad for me. He and his family have fled the violence to his hometown in the east. Today he's back in Dili to check how much has been looted in his absence. Inside are hundreds of deaths he's been contracted to build for the country's new schools. Many have now been stolen. To start building this business, it was very hard because I have to borrow money from the bank. And uh, now there are many things stolen. And Edu's story is all the more poignant because he was jailed and tortured several times under the Indonesian occupation. But he survived and went on to employ nearly 80 people here including Indonesian carpenters. You fought against the Indonesians for 24 years, and you, and you suffered a lot, and you were imprisoned and tortured, but you don't feel safe now in your own capital. Yeah, it, it takes time to, it takes time, a little while, I think. Maybe this, it, it will be changed after a few months, I think. But now, at the moment, I don't feel safe. Nor do tens of thousands of others. Huge camps have sprung up along the road heading east from Dili. People who thought the war was over when Indonesia left seven years ago now living on refugee handouts, too frightened to go home. Back in the capital, a shaky peace is holding thanks to the presence of the International Intervention Force. These are troops from New Zealand. As so often in new nations, this crisis began in the army. It's a very young force, based on the guerrilla movement that fought for independence. It still relies on foreign training. Today, a fresh batch of NCOs is graduating, but a cloud hangs over the occasion. Nearly half the enlisted men, recruits from the West, were sacked back in February after going on strike. And they've since been involved in armed clashes with these loyal soldiers, clashes which also drew in much of the police force. The man about to become their new prime minister is here, along with their commanders. These are former guerrilla fighters who once enjoyed unrivaled respect. But the recent violence has raised serious questions about their proper role 
in a democratic East Timor. By calling in the army, it alienated the police. The police felt betrayed, humiliated, angry, and the men started fleeing the city with their weapons. And then uh, a few weeks later, about roughly three weeks later, we began to have a uh, confrontation between armed police and uh, the loyal uh, army. And I would say uh, the army and the police ended up being victims of uh, policy errors, judgments, decisions made by my government. The confrontations culminated with a massacre of police officers in May. They'd already surrendered their weapons to UN mediators, but were fired on all the same. Well, this is the spot where those unarmed police officers were gunned down in cold blood by soldiers. It was perhaps the worst in a series of shockingly violent incidents which caused the disintegration of the security forces and split communities here between people from the east and the west of the country. So why has East Timor, the most ambitious and promising nation-building exercise ever undertaken by the United Nations, collapsed so quickly? There was never much to build with. Even today, the country is littered with ruins from the wholesale destruction carried out by Indonesian troops and militias. And the people of East Timor were ill-equipped to do much of the building themselves poorly educated and often traumatized by the long independence war. Today, most are trapped in abject poverty. These challenges might have been overcome, though, if the United Nations had done a better job of building the army and especially the police. But it left them half-formed, riven by internal rivalries and easily manipulated by ambitious politicians. At the army base, I found Lino Saldana, a deputy police commissioner now in hiding from his colleagues. He told me of his growing alarm as he watched the interior minister, Ruggiero Lobato, importing hundreds of sophisticated guns and handing them out to his supporters. But when the weapons come in, the weapons distribute without any monitoring, without any control. And uh, sometimes, you know, not only commander, but minister also decide to distribute the weapon for the people they feel that can trust, trust them. Civilians? And if, yes, even the civilian, like what you say, uh, their reality already have evidence right now, and uh, a lot of civilians carry the weapon. And this, this whole thing is a big disaster. 